thrilled to introduce uh, Sohyun Wong, Dr. Sohyun Wong, uh, as of like, you know, maybe 20 minutes from now, whenever the Northwestern administration gets around to approving the final dissertation filing. Um, so Hyun completed her PhD uh, like this month in the Media Technology and Society program at Northwestern. Uh, I was her advisor, so I'm like really, really proud and thrilled uh, and has published work in a variety of different places that I'm not gonna list right now, um, but uh, is moving on to start a postdoc position at the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton University uh, this fall. Um, and uh, is gonna start us off today with, uh, with a talk about some recent research on the Fediverse. So, so Hyun, please take it away. Yay, oh, thanks Aaron for the intro um, and also for the patience because I, I did like my final revisions for the dissertation from the Grand Canyon and it was like a little, a little tight there with the deadlines. Um, let me just share my screen first. Let's see, can folks see that pretty well? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Great to be here again. I'm Sohyun, just finishing up my PhD. Um, indeed, I was part of the Community Data Science Collective, which is hosting today's dialogue. So again, thanks to the group for giving me like a chance to chat a bit more on my way out again. Um, I always love chatting in places that are outside of strictly academic spaces. So this is always really nice to come back to. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to be talking about work that I did with um, not folks in the CDSC, but other people, um, Priyanka Nanayakra, who is here in the call today, and Jan, who is not here because he has another um, event that he's at right now. Um, but yeah, this work is currently under review, um, which means that it might evolve a little. Would love to get comments and feedback on it through the discussion we have. Um, but it really began maybe like, I don't know, a year and a half ago, two years ago with the some discussions that the three of us had online about kind of like the revitalized interest in the promise of decentralized platforms as a way of designing social media to give users more autonomy over things like privacy um, than we are pretty much used to at this point on centralized platforms that have really come to dominate our digital lives, right? Um, Decentralized platforms can give communities of users more control over things like social decisions, such as rules, policies, et cetera. So all these things that might allow or cut off information from being um, shared or ac accessed in a particular digital space. Um, but they also give communities control over technical decisions like hardware choices, um, settings, code, basically all these things that really shape data retention, access and sharing for community members. Um, but communities are of course like run by volunteers and regular people who might not have uh, like things like resources, the time, technical expertise, or even like legal know-how to really protect things like privacy for community members, right? Um, there's a lot of work on burnout that people have kind of pointed to that uh, community leaders have to deal with. And also more broadly, kind of like the intense labor of moderation and governance work that's entailed by community uh, governance in general. I think another thing to kind of think about is like, Popularly, people don't think of privacy as really the primary goal of social media, which we think of as like sharing, is meant for sharing information online, right? So things like privacy are kind of back of mind until something goes wrong. And in this project, we wanted to focus on how privacy expectations are shaped in decentralized communities that are dealing with this tension between like autonomy and all these like other constraints. And we did this through an interview study with a bunch of people. Um, and we're asking two questions through the interviews. The first is, you know, what aspects of community governance do communities use to shape um, privacy expectations? And the second is, how do those, um, how does the decentralized nature of the platform um, aid or undermine those privacy expectations that people have in communities? And I say platform in quote marks a little here because I'm using the term a little loosely, I think. Because um, the site of our study is the Fediverse, which uh, I'm, I think some people who are familiar with it will be like, okay, it's a little funny to call it a platform because of the way it's set up. Um, but we can kind of talk about that later. Um, for folks who are not familiar with the Fediverse, basically after Elon Musk bought Twitter in 2022 and turned it into X, the Fediverse is kind of like the alternative microblogging social media thing that people were migrating to. It of course existed far before 2022, but it became very, very popular in 2022. 
um, on the Fediverse, instead of joining something like a centralized platform, you make an account on an instance, which is also known as a server, which I'm also gonna talk about as like a community. Um, and this instance allows you to connect to and communicate with users on your instance, as well as users on other instances. And so this network of instances um, make up the Fediverse. Um, Another important thing about instances is that they can use different softwares. Usually um, the softwares are open source and the most popular one right now is Mastodon. So for example, on the screen here, I'm showing kind of a screenshot of the instance that I'm on. They use Mastodon um, and this like kind of determines important things about like how I can interact with other people by defining the user interface, right? Um, the, the software will also make some other pretty important technical decisions, or not the software, the, um, the server admins will make some pretty important technical decisions, like where the data is going to be stored, through what kind of services, and who's going to have backend access, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another important bit about instances is that they can write their own privacy policies. So here's another um, screenshot from the server that I'm on. Um, and privacy policies um, seem like a pretty direct, super easy way to establish customized privacy expectations for communities, right? Like, especially if communities are having a lot of different privacy needs or goals. Um, but there's recent work that really shows that communities overwhelmingly don't customize their privacy policies. So Tosh et al. found in a sample of about 350 Mastodon instances, only 10% had tailored the policy text, actually. Um, I think... It's worth noting that that study is Mastodon specific. So it's only looking at servers that use the Mastodon software. Um, and Mastodon does have a default privacy policy that people use, which likely helps explain that very low number that we're seeing. On, on our end, we also took a random sample of privacy policies on the Fediverse that were not just Mastodon, but indeed still a lot of Mastodon just because it's very popular. Um, and we saw roughly similar pattern of people not customizing policies in significant ways. One of the things that the Tosh et al. paper suggests is that things like privacy policies might really just be like a force of habit, um, kind of like just a holdover from approaches to privacy that we're really used to seeing on centralized platforms. Um, and so the question that they raise is like, maybe they don't really work or make a ton of sense for decentralized ecosystems like the Fediverse. And so popping back to the research questions that motivated our study, um, I think in the next like 15 ish minutes, I'm going to try to extract or like walk through the findings in, in terms of like more practical takeaways of how decentralized communities do deal with privacy. The first set of findings is around building interpersonal trust in communities. So this is really like trust that community leaders, the admins, the mods, um, the people who are managing your back end, um, that they're going to make good faith efforts to protect the privacy of community members in their decision making. So our interviews pointed to three things that admins did slash focused on that really played a role in shaping trust with respect to privacy concerns. And the first was in how people were crafting rules. So rules are, you know, a basic signal that told people both the values of the community and in turn kind of what kinds of audiences they'd be networked with by virtue of being uh, by virtue of joining that community. And since rules can be a little fuzzy, once again, a screenshot from the server that I'm on, it's things like, you know, be respectful and mindful uh, in your critique of ideas, respect other ident others' identities in full. Um, using their specific specified pronouns. Um, so generally they're like prescriptions of what you can and can't do. And you can kind of imagine that these rules might deter certain kinds of online interactions or provide easy justification for blocking certain kinds of users. Um, and there's a lot of other work that I won't talk about today about how to make rules more effective in online contexts. Um, but the thing that our interviews emphasized was that the construction and um, the reading of these rules actually quite matter a lot to people. So here is a quote from an interview participant um, saying, you know, whether or not people have put an effort into writing server rules is an indication of whether or not a problem is something that admins are seriously concerned about. And then they kind of further specify um, if people are going down to a more specific level in, in like what the, how the rule might be enforced, for example, um, that says to me, they're probably more experienced with this kind of moderation and spend more time on it. 
And so this, this is kind of like a point about moderation, right? But it did come out directly from a conversation about privacy and um, how privacy interacts with questions of moderation. Um, and what this person was really pointing to is that the detail and concreteness of the rules matter in signaling and really fostering a sense of good faith effort that your information is going to be um, one, network to the right people and two, will stay withheld from the wrong people. The second thing that admins did to foster interpersonal trust was by taking care to address technical misunderstandings about how information kind of bops around on the Fediverse. So you can see in the quote here that people are pretty concerned that most community members um, on their servers just don't have a good mental model of how their information um, was going to be collected stored and shared on the Fediverse. Um, and this is because the Fediverse does have a pretty radically different infrastructure than the average person might be used to with centralized platforms like Twitter. And so this person is kind of talking to, or talking about when people make posts that maybe they shouldn't be making because they don't realize how networked this content is actually going to be. And when that happens, um, admins described actively checking in with those users, like messaging them directly um, saying, hey, Maybe this isn't something you want to post. Um, do you understand like where this is going basically? Kind of related to that, this also meant that admins made greater efforts to onboard newcomers. So um, here's another quote from a participant who's kind of recalling times that users have approached them with specific privacy concerns and they've kind of talked them through what settings to um, choose and how to basically just how to be a little more careful and be aware of what kind of vulnerabilities there might be. And then finally, we also did hear about one way privacy policies could be useful for shaping um, privacy expectations among community members. Um, so this is a quote from someone who had, had indeed taken the time to edit their privacy policy a little. They were like, I'm bolding this line here so that people really, really get this point and are a little more careful about sharing sensitive information. Um, I think this point is actually quite interesting because um, when we had people read the privacy policies with us and talk us through them, they did point out that policies could be really useful for laying out technical details and like kind of establishing a baseline understanding of the technology. But um, they also acknowledge that not everyone is reading them. Um, and in fact, barely anyone is reading privacy policies. So there's like this question of like, is this an underutilized opportunity? Um, like how can we use privacy policies a little better? All right, and then kind of these efforts to address technical misunderstandings naturally bring us to the final way that admin behavior kind of interacts with trust here. And this is in how admins were communicating with and updating users. So in our interviews, people were judging how admins were communicating in roughly three ways. Um, the first was whether the admin had a history of engagement with community members and other users online. So this might be on the Fediverse specifically, but it was also, you know, any other linked accounts that people had, maybe someone had like a history of good engagement and interesting content on Twitter or something before they came to the Fediverse and people really liked that. And so they felt like they could trust this person more. Um, I think the more straightforward one was whether admins were proactively posting updates on a dedicated admin account. So again, I'm showing on the screen an example of an admin account for the server that I'm on. Um, I think maybe a little ironically, they don't actually have any po posts right now. I think they might have read it a little more recently and the individual admins used to be um, posting updates before because I have seen conversations on my server about this kind of stuff too. The third bit in communication was um, how responsive an admin was to community questions and concerns. Um, so here, this person is kind of talking about, you know, the guy who runs the server, we make sure that he's on top of it. I mean, he's on top of it anyway, but like, if he weren't, we would notice and it would be, you know, we would deal with it. Um, basically, this person is pointing out how the, the admin of their server does really respond to their concerns. You know, none of this would be meaningful if, people voice concerns and the admin didn't respond at all. But all three of these things kind of come together to help people make, to help um, people feel like the admin can be held accountable if something goes wrong. And that's kind of why all these communication factors do matter. Um, I think a side note here is that 
The fact that the Fediverse is infrastructurally decentralized does play a role. Like um, in contrast to a centralized platform like Twitter, uh, people noted that community leaders don't really have a profit incentive for running their communities. And so the concerns that we normally associate with privacy issues in social media um, suddenly matter a lot less on the Fediverse. Um, uh, but that also doesn't mean that there aren't any privacy concerns. Um, instead, what we kind of found was that the um, decentralization of the Fediverse meant that the key tensions underpinning privacy in this context were really around incompatibilities that emerge between communities. I think like the best way I can describe it is something like, like, okay, let's say I really trust my admin to make all these great choices about my data and how my posts are going to spread across the Fediverse and communicates with me really, really well. Um, but the reality is, you know, my admin is not calling all the shots on, on Fedi, right? There's a lot of other admins that are also making choices for their servers and my information might be getting shared to them when we're federated and connected to each other and like sharing posts with each other. So in our work, we call these governance frictions to describe how governance decisions made in other communities can undermine a community's own efforts to protect the privacy of their members. So um, we use the term friction to kind of evoke the metaphor of adding friction in meeting like one's internal goals here. And they are kind of like the second set of findings in our study here. Uh, we identified, I think, three main kinds of incompatibilities. The first, our value incompatibilities. So this is when values about content and behavior differ. Um, I think the one that really comes to mind is like when free speech absolutism is a thing in one community, but not the other. So kind of the way that you can talk to each other is very different. Um, and here's a quote for one participant who kind of talks about this. They say, you know, it's not illegal for somebody to use curse words at me and call me slurs online but I don't want our community to be involved with that. Um, I think value incompatibilities are pretty familiar to most people when we talk about privacy with respect to questions of harassment. You know, they, I think they reflect the desire to be protected from people who wish you harm, try to be aggressive to you, or are really uncivil, may try to dox you and whatnot. The second set of incompatibilities are security incompatibilities. So this is when like security practices in the back end of instance setup differ since content is shared across communities. Um, so here's a good quote to kind of evoke that. Um, this person is saying, even if the admin on my instance, AKA me, tries to be very security conscious and all, um, if the fine admin of some other instance were to make a security oopsie, then that is going to affect anyone who has had dealings with them. And so this can be things like the, the hardware that you use, how you give access or secure the backend, the, the software or services that you're using. Um, I think this point is really interesting because it's kind of invisible most of the time, like this person is saying, um, until there's a problem. And then finally, um, the last one was around software incompatibilities. So you might recall that instances can choose what software to run their server with, like um, a lot of them using Mastodon. Um, the problem is that when software that the that two instances run differ, um, the features that are relevant for privacy might not be consistent. So here, this person says, you know, if I reply to something that's marked private on a on Mastodon, so like a server using Mastodon, um, that post would be shown to other people who use Friendica, which is another software, um, because that post isn't marked private on Friendica. And so this person is kind of talking about a, they're, they're reflecting on an experience where they had reboosted or retooted um, a post from someone and it had been marked private on their server, um, but that private tag did not translate into their server when they were like looking at it from their interface. So you can see how the differences in software and how they present information, what kind of tags they offer to people can make a really big difference. All right. I think our key takeaway from talking with folks about these incompatibilities is that there's currently a lack of support for communities to um, anticipate 
you know, visualize and deliberate about these um, key differences between themselves and other communities that would in fact undermine privacy expectations. Um, I think the only concrete mechanism that people um, pointed to were things like blocks and defederation, but they really emphasize that these are limited in effectiveness, you know, have easy workarounds and can be pretty adversarial as a process. Um, I, I, do, I will say that the interviews didn't point to clear strategies or consensus about what alternative mechanisms we might pursue. So that would be like a really great discussion to have today. I'm starting to think about that. Um, I think the bottom line is that people really underscored that more intentional discussion and negotiation needs to be possible between communities. And um, this is kind of like a standing challenge for future work, um, not just for the Fediverse, but also you know, attempts to decentralize decision-making on platforms more broadly. And in, in, in terms of our work, I highlight the three incompatibilities here because I think of them as kind of like a triangle of like interrelated focal points, I guess, kind of um, that we might kind of uh, devise interventions for in order to improve privacy protections through community governance strategies. All right. I think I'm running short on time. So in summary, to kind of like show you guys the, the practical takeaways that we tried to distill here and then kind of looking ahead, some things to think about, you know, the stuff about interpersonal trust really point to, or really are asking about more work for people to do to ensure that trust um, is built in communities. So one question is like, how can we ease the burden of labor for this kind of thing? Um, and another question is like, are these actually accurate signals of trustworthiness trustworthiness with respect to privacy? And if not, what are better ones? Um, with the frictions, I would love to talk with folks more about like, you know, tooling and approaches to make incompatibilities visible or um, perhaps even resolve them in some way. And, and another question that we had is moving forward is like, what's the practical usefulness of frictions as a metaphor to help provoke thought about this kind of problem? All right, thank you very much. That was a bit of a manic whirlwind. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen here, but feel free to contact me um, afterwards. Awesome, thank you so much, Sohyun. Um, and Priyanka, who's here, and Jan, who's not here for uh, the work you put into this. Um, I see we've got one uh, comment in the chat already. I did want to just explicitly invite folks to put comments in the chat and or use the you know hand raising uh, mechanism in Zoom to let us know if you'd like to speak. Um, maybe on the admin team, does somebody mind stopping or pausing? Madison. Thank you so much. Um, okay, welcome back everybody from the break. Uh, now I have the honor of introducing uh, Professor Seth Fry, uh, Associate Professor of Communication from UC Davis. Um, Seth, and I'm mostly just cribbing off of his uh, online profile here. So if you wanna read more, I would encourage you to check out his uh, website and nfascination.com, which I can post the link to in the chat or if, if nobody else beats me to it. Um, but Seth really focuses on using computational approaches to study self-governance, um, focusing on online communities as sort of model systems for thinking about institutions, culture, um, organizations, variety of other phenomena. Um, he got his PhD from Indiana University all the way back in 2013 uh, and has been rocking it ever since then. And, um, and has been, you know, really uh, an inspiration and a great interlocutor for a lot of the work that happens in our group uh, and with many of the communities that we connect with in our research. Um, and, uh, you know, just I, I, I love hearing what Seth has been up to and learning from his work. And I'm happy that we get to do that together today. So take it away, Seth. All right, thank you, everybody. It's such a love fest here, so, um, and it's and a really uh, delightful and impressive, also how much uh, how much of Wikimedia is here. Um, let's see. So um, today I'm sharing. Oh well, I guess a little bit more about me. I'm really interested in the internet as a laboratory for institution design and a laboratory for institutional analysis. Um, 
online communities are perfect little kind of, you know, self-contained worlds of which there are thousands. And by comparing lots of them in the same way that cell biologists study lots of cells and psychologists study lots of individuals, uh, um, doing social science by comparing lots of societies gives us a sense of how they work um, as a population. And it's, and that kind of work is a nice complement to the kind of closer case analysis um, that uh, So Hyun just presented, which was also, also kind of comparative. Um, and then uh, intellectually, I'm really interested in the commons. And I think the commons gives us a framework, not only for studying the limited resources that online communities so often manage, um, but um, connects them to larger kind of human themes. Uh, you know, it's the case that um, uh, the tragedy of the commons, the difficulty of doing everything from, um, from uh, managing superbugs and uh, managing uh, atmospheric carbon is the same as managing bad behavior uh, in an online community or keeping uh, the kitchen sink clean, uh, which is my experience, um, like Mako's, of living in intentional communities for a long time. Uh, so um, to, to bring it all together, I end up studying um, lots of communities on lots of platforms. These are examples of things covering um, Reddit, the, the, the video game world of Warcraft, Minecraft. We have work on GitHub. We're sharing uh, the, a project um, today on the Apache Software Foundation, um, of course, Wikipedia, and larger comparative stuff across domains. Um, the work today is, um, is by Mahaswata Chakraborty. It is published. Um, uh, recently in, um, in Kai, uh, which is the big um, human computer interaction uh, venue uh, with several colleagues who I love a lot. And I really love this work and I'm really eager to share it. So uh, there's, there's a chance Mako would recognize this photo. This is from um, uh, Stanford's um, uh, CASBIS. Uh, I, was in, I was in the bathroom and there's this, this switch. It doesn't do anything. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's switched to locked from uh, between it locked and unlocked. And it has a sign that says, leave unlocked. And it's kind of a question, what would you do? You know, do you, do you intervene? I, I'm just a guest for the day, right? Do you intervene and flip it back to unlocked because the sign says it should have been unlocked? Or do you, do you leave it? Cause that's how it was, right? What, um, uh, and that's, that's part of a larger question of, do we run how we say we run? Do, do, do the written rules, uh, are they a description of a social system? And should they be a description of a social system? When they're different, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And how do we know? How do we even measure it? So that's really the motivation of this work. Um, practically, uh, we're, we're, it's a, this is a study of the Apache Software Foundation. This is a study, a comparative study of several, about 250 open source communities, all under the umbrella of, of one foundation. Um, and so they're contributing uh, to, you know, your daily experience on the internet. So uh, this matters because open source matters. Um, uh, open source success uh, depends on behavior and it has a structure. And we have theories that relate behavior and structure, but we still don't know if those theories are good. And we still don't know if it's good to relate behavior and structure. You know, does behavior in an organization follow its formal structure? And is that important? Uh, d does it run how uh, it says it runs is also theoretically important because uh, if you if you know your your social science theory, pretty much every discipline has a version of this question. There's formal structure. There's informal structure. What's their relationship? Um, and the the unanimous conclusion across all the disciplines is no, never. <laughs> you know, it's always different. Uh, but that's not the end. That's the beginning, right? Because uh, we don't know if it's good. We don't know when it's good. It's just a hard question to ask fundamentally in any rigorous way. Um, uh, and, and it's worth asking, what would you even need to answer it in a rigorous way? Well, you'd need a good representation of the formal structure of a community. You'd need really, really, really thorough data on the day-to-day -day operations of that community. You'd need a way to relate so that when you saw every action, you could almost tag it as it relates to these rules. And only then would you kind of be able to lay the rules next to the behavior and say, do these line up? Are these related to each other in any way? Now, that's pretty hard, especially finding a community so transparent that every single action they perform uh, and every single rule they abide by are both publicly available. And that's really what's special about the Apache Software Foundation as a research subject not just as a thing that's, that's valuable to properly understand because of how it serves the internet. 
Uh, and that's how we get to Apache, um, uh, which has a lot of projects behind it. And we publish a lot of work on it because of this very clean structure that they run an incubator for new projects that want to enter the, 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 the official foundation. And they can either graduate or retire. A scientist is going to call that a binary success outcome. And so we end up getting to build, collect data and build models that predict success or failure to enter the foundation, whatever that means. It's actually not bad to fail in this context. It, it could mean you don't fit. Um, and another special thing about uh, Apache Software Foundation, um, they have these principles. They have lots of rules and policies. Uh, one of them you'll see open communications is the third one. So literally all emails about every project are uh, public ex uh, uh, by default. And then you can do some tricks to, to, to talk privately about specific personnel or whatever. But it means all business by expectation is public. And we get to see everything that happens and relate it to other formal rules like the ones on this page. So Apache Software Foundation has been around for a while. It makes really important software. In my mind, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the first uh, success, it's one of the first early kind of, it's the first breakout success story of open source in the sense of making something that was better than commercial and really proving open source. That, you know, uh, I, as, a, as, a, as an outsider, right? I'm sure there's other earlier examples, but for me, it certainly it was the first to really get on the map. Um, it's mentored a lot of projects. It expanded out of one project to hundreds. Uh, so it provides administrative support, licensing, legal support, branding and production standards support to lots of projects as an umbrella organization. And we're gonna compare those projects because they're, they're comparable, but they're all held to the same standard. It does that with rules. So at the bottom of the screen, you have an example of, uh, of, of, one of, of an email communication describing the rules. Uh, and so this is what we get to relate. We get to relate the email communications to the formal rules uh, um, on different governance topics. Our research questions are going to be like this. What's the relationship of rules and form and rules and use? Uh, put another way, how do foundation policies relate project operations and performance? Does the formalization um, of activity around a given topic, let's say licensing or how to use the wiki uh, or uh, software releases, the formalization around a topic, is it at all related to the amount of activity on that topic, to the actual amount that people talk about um, uh, releases or uh, licensing uh, or, or, or branding or wikis? Uh, so that's one. And then there's the question of internalization, which we're going to operationalize very specifically. When people talk about a governed activity, do they use the same words as the words in the rules? Uh, if the answer is yes, that's almost evidence that they're internalizing the formal structure or that the formal structure kind of follows like how people talk. Uh, well, either way, the formal, you know, by whatever mechanism where we can say there that the formal rules are internalized. Um, uh, or do people use different words? You know, straight up semantic distance is what we're going to do analytically. Uh, do people use different words when they talk about a, the same governed activity as, as, as is formally regulated? And then uh, uh, do when there's a match or when there's not a match, does that have anything to do with success? Here's our data. There's only 250 sentences of policy, of formal policy that we pull out. Uh, and there's 700, uh, there's uh, 700,000 emails with two, 2 million sentences. Uh, and after we do some filtering, it's about 20% of that has to do with one of the governed activities that we find. We find, we, I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we find about 40 governed activities. So, um, and we, so we collect a bunch of uh, stuff, other information about every project, other information about um, all the contributors, how much they're contributing, um, uh, how long the project has been in the incubation process. And this is all just stuff that'll help us do statistics. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the text of the email and we're gonna do a bunch of linguistics on it. This, I'm showing you what we, like, I'm showing you what we did. I'm not gonna get into how we did it. I'm just giving you some jargon. Don't feel like you have to understand this. The point is we're taking raw text strings from email and we're kind of extracting their subjects and objects and verbs and, and, um, and their shoulds, mays, musts to develop a representation of what the rules are relating. And if we do that for every email, we do that for every rule, we get the kind of raw materials we need to relate the rules um, to, the, to the policies, and, uh, to the emails and build that one-to-one -one relationship, that labeling of every sentence in every email to some governed activity. 
Uh, and we have other formalisms that then take the linguistics and bring it back into um, like governance structure, institutional structure. This all comes from the work of Elnor Ostrom and her community uh, um, who studies common pool resource management institutions that I'm kind of borrowing from and mapping. Again, you don't have to understand this. You just this, uh, skim it and you'll, you'll get the gist that we're doing this mapping exercise. Um, ditto, we did a bunch of um, computer science to kind of turn the emails and turn the, the rules and cluster them together. And there are 200 clusters and 40 of those clusters had rules in them. And so we said those 40 clusters, any email in those same clusters was about like a governed subject. And we threw away the other, the other 160 topics, just kept the, 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 the 40. And then we did a bunch of other stuff to relate every sentence to the nearest rule in the same cluster to kind of, to do that labeling exercise. And out of all of it, we get the governed topics and how much activities uh, and, how, and how many rules they get. And we get a bunch of other stuff. So here's the first result. What gets governed um, in the Apache Software Foundation incubator? So what you're seeing here in blue is, uh, is the number of rules. Well, here, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Here are the top things that get governed. Mostly like how committees work, the, 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 the committees that manage projects. Um, second, licensing gets talked about a lot. Third, email communication gets talked about a lot. Uh, release, uh, how to release software gets talked about a lot. More committee stuff, how to vote, more, uh, a bunch of reporting about your status, how to commit, um, uh, and so on. So these are the main things that have formal policy. And here's how much policy they have. So you're saying about, what, 10, 15? Uh, um, uh, so topics that have several sentences describing them, and a bunch that have very few, a bunch of topics that have very few, or even one, just one rule describing them. So that's the layout. And here's our question: What if I give you the same plot over these same topics, not for the written rules, but for the email conversations? Are we going to see the same sloping downward, or are we going to see a different pattern? Are we going to see the opposite pattern? I'd love for you to develop an intuition. Will, do people talk about things the same amount that they make rules for things? Or is there no relationship? Or is it almost the opposite, that the more rules there are for a thing, the less we have to talk about it because the friction has been solved, the precedent has been encoded. So in, in which case, the, 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 as the blue goes down, the orange should go up. So develop your intuition. Here's the punchline in three, two, one. Um, no relationship. Uh, the orange is just kind of all over the place. What that means is that the amount people are talking about every governed activity doesn't really relate to how many rules that governed activity has. Uh, so that's interesting already. That's kind of interesting already. Um, I had all these theories and this, <laughs> this went against all of them. Um, next thing is internalization. So remember how I said the orange should go down? What you might see here is that this, the, these little um, uh, box plots, they go down with the blue. And what that means is the more rules there are for a thing, the more people talk about the thing in the same way that it's formalized. We're saying the more the rules there are about a thing, the more it's internalized. So there actually is something going on. Rules are having some effect on people's activity, not how much they talk about, but certainly how they talk about. And that's kind of interesting. There's something there. Um, and then these are regressions. It's a bunch of stuff. Here's the takeaway. There are areas that have a lot of rules. You've seen that with the blue, with all the blue. There are also areas that predict success. When we run a, a regression, we get some things that are significant across these topics, relating the topics to success. Um, but areas that have a lot of rules aren't necessarily the ones that, that are predicting success. The ones that are predicting success are all over the place. Like how you talk about a real, um, how you talk about project wikis ended up having a relationship to success, which we uh, which we figured out this way that um, uh, when you're failing, you dot you have to add a bunch of documentation about your about the status of your failure. So uh, so that's like a spurious relationship, but it kind of is a, a nice sanity check. Um, that failing causes or is strongly related to talking about the wiki because you have to follow the, the, um, the failure rules. Um, yeah, so, you know, those are our results. Here's the conclusion, you know, communities do not run how they say we run, which you could have guessed, um, but there's more here. So that's the beginning, not the end. Project success depends at least as much on action in domains with fewer rules 
as action demands with more rules. So, um, uh, you know, quantity isn't really what's predicting whether a, a, a certain type of governance activity is important. Um, we're finding more rules on a topic does not relate to more activities on a topic, which I think is really kind of interesting, even though it's simple. Although more rules on topic does uh, correspond to more internalization of that topic. Uh, and all of this is to wrap up to ask, you know, okay, we don't run how we uh, say we run, but should we? Um, just to do some shout outs, I'm part of the Medigov project, um, which is a sort of peer community to, to CBSC and a lot of my colleagues, a lot of the work comes out of it. I want to do another thing to say Mahaswada is graduating and we'll be looking for um, postdocs and faculty positions. Um, uh, I want her on your radar because I love what she does. I'm really proud of it. Um, I'm hiring I have two postdocs. And if you're interested in the laboratory experiment side of collective behavior and collective action, we are, we're doing some stuff on lab experiments. If you know any recent graduates who have strong software engineering and a strong interest in social science questions around governance and collective action and collective intelligence, and separate from all this quantitative stuff, I'm doing a lot of on the ground stuff on basic skills. I'm almost starting to wonder if structure doesn't matter at all. And what matters is what people know going into a community. That how would our things, how would, would democracy work better if every single person had management training, knowing how to run a team, uh, uh, manage conflict, manage time, plan events, lead meetings, start projects, and, uh, and really, if everyone was a community manager and had formal training as a community manager, would that, is that what we needed the whole time? So I, I have a project right now with um, uh, an, an organizer I respect a lot. Uh, we're looking to build a kind of core group to, to standardize um, this kind of list of skills that every person needs to be a responsible member of a self-governing community. If this sounds interesting to you, if you think the missing thing is skills and you want to put in three to five hours of work to help uh, a week helping us um, kind of formalize that and build a community around that. I'd really love to hear from you. Um, and that's it for me. I hope I didn't go too over time. You kind of a whirlwind. That was great. Uh, thank you so much, Seth. Um, Uh, so, you know, I think, uh, it, it, piling on to Mako's comment, I had all these intuitions and the results went against all of them, uh, is a very familiar experience, um, to me as well. And I so appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I'm curious what others make of the things that did, that did come out of this, um, for now, I think let's go ahead. Maybe, uh, Madison, do you mind pausing the recording?